Hi, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Suzanne Hugh, and I'm the educational director and founder of cleanearthforkids.org. I am proud to introduce Jillian. She will talk with you about the important things that we're going to cover tonight. So take it away, Jillian. Thank you. My name is Jillian. Um, I'm a public health major and I work closely with Team 5 to stop pesticides and toxic chemicals. Uh, if you're a student watching this, you can earn community service by writing two pages of notes and a short summary of what you've learned. There's more information on our website at cleanearthforkids.org. Also on our website, you can use your voice and sign many petitions. We also offer contests uh, in art, music, writing, poetry, STEM, and infographics. Some examples of our contests include a poetry contest made by one of our poets, Kevin. Um, another project was the These Are the Hands contest and the Protect What You Love contest created by one of our talented artists, Chelsea. Um, your participation in our projects like the arts, the infographics, the video clips, stories, essays, and all of the other projects are helping to bring awareness to what we need to protect. Right now, the Trump administration is in the process of overturning 100 environmental protections. These impact our health, our wildlife, clean air, and clean water. We cannot sit by and let it happen. Uh, a quick thank you to the New York Times, the Sabin Center for Climate Change at Columbia University and Harvard for putting together these climate deregulation trackers, which always keep us up to date on the latest information and it is a huge help. Now a little later on, I'll be sharing some information about rollbacks pertaining to methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas that's linked directly to climate change. Uh, methane gets into the atmosphere by drilling or fracking, which I will explain later. And um, we've talked about it several times on panel discussions. It is a very big deal. Um, now in August, the EPA completed the process of rolling back uh, rules on methane, um, which I've already said is a, a powerful greenhouse gas uh, that's linked directly to climate change. Uh, these rules impacted the leaks or flares from the drilling process. Um, in April, it completed rollbacks on rules from tailpipe emissions. And in June of 2019, it replaced the Obama era rule that required coal uh, plants to reduce emissions. Um, and it was replaced with a rule that was specifically created to allow plants to continue to release more pollution. Now, in the first few months of office, President Trump announced that he would withdraw the United States from the 2015 Paris Climate Accord, under which nearly every country in the world has pledged to reduce emissions of uh, planet warming pollution. If former Vice President Biden is elected, he has promised to return uh, to the Paris Agreement and to reinstate those rules while pushing to enact even stronger policies, spending two trillion to promote the development of renewable energy sources such as wind and solar power. The uh, Trump has also packed his administration with senior officials who deny science and climate change. For example, uh, a Climate denier has been hired to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which conducts important scientific research on climate change. Uh, now, this climate denier, who was not welcome at the University of Delaware, uh, where he was a scientist, questioned human-caused global warming. Um, it might be because he has ties to an organization called the Heartland Institute which is involved in running campaigns to deny climate change. Uh, the Heartland Institute is a conservative and libertarian public policy think tank, which basically means they focus on influencing uh, lawmakers. It also has ties to other organizations which fund uh, campaigns to deny uh, climate science. Um, with all of these things, that are that these people are doing wrong and they're in very high places it can feel discouraging but please remember that as the intergovernmental panel on climate change says every action matters 
What this means is that everything that you work towards, even the smallest changes, make a difference. So many amazing people are working together to set goals, uh, targets, and timelines to take action. We must reduce the amount of carbon in our atmosphere. Let us support policies that cut heat trapping gas emissions as soon as possible while helping the poor, vulnerable, uh, the poor and vulnerable already disproportionately suffering its impacts. That was, um, and as the IPCC says, everything matters. So the IPCC has also stated um, that they want to reach a net zero emission goal. Now, they realize the only way to stop climate change is to reach zero carbon emissions as fast as possible. But like I said, their true goal is to reach negative, net negative emissions. Now that means that um, emissions in the atmosphere will actually be absorbed uh, than emitted. So you'll have even less carbon in the air than there was before. And they have stated several goals on how to reach this. Um, and the best one is to replace fossil fuels with electricity that is produced from low carbon systems like solar and wind energy. And they have stated an even more specific number that um, carbon emissions must be down to 400 or 350 ppm. Now that may seem like a big goal and it is, but it is vitally important and now uh, I'll ask Jonah to introduce himself. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jonah. Uh, thanks for introducing me, Jillian. And as you said, uh, every action matters, which is why I'm so grateful for all the work that all of my fellow youth board members and interns here at Clean Earth for Kids are doing. Uh, thanks to our assistant project managers, Judith and Janice for their artwork, curriculum writing, and uh, so much stuff that they do. And also to our youth board members, Gabby and Darren, uh, for their videos on cleanerforkids.org website, as well as our YouTube channel, as well as their work to stock uh, toxic chem chemicals and pesticides. And a shout out to Chelsea for her social and environmental justice project called These Are the Hands, uh, and our intern Neem for her project management. And next week, our new intern Connor has some exciting news to share about our Indigenous Youth Commission which is a part of our social justice commission. Um, so I'm from California and as the world's fifth largest economy, uh, California can continue to lead the way in, um, in climate change related issues because we're such a diverse state with tremendous resources and people here from every background, race, religion, have the opportunity to come together and continue to support children's health, public health and our economy. Uh, as John Williams will discuss later, Pollution has a cost to everyone, uh, including and cost to workers. Uh, when workers are sick because of poor air quality due to fires, for example, as we've seen this, these past few weeks, and they can't perform their jobs, uh, production suffers and therefore our economy suffers. Um, this week with such horrible air quality all throughout the state, it was hard for so many people to concentrate on their jobs, for students to study and learn. Um, so that's why in the, in the context of these fires, Tonight's panel discussion is on pollution and from stopping big polluters from further contributing to climate change. Um, so first we have a little bit uh, of good news. County supervisors on Tuesday adopted a general plan for the next 20 years uh, with measures to slow down climate change and increase restrictions on oil drilling near homes and schools and un unincorporated areas. And this newly adopted plan calls for a 2,500 foot setback between new oil wells and schools, which is likely the largest such expanse enacted in the state. Uh, it triples the setbacks between homes and new oil wells to 1,500 feet with the potential of additional action to boost that figure up to 2,500 feet. Which is, this is super important um, to reduce toxic pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, um, which are fueling climate change. And there was a bill that was up uh, in the California legislature called AB 435, which would have done the same thing for the entire state of California. Um, unfortunately, that didn't make it out of committee uh, after some donations from the fossil fuel industry, which is really sad to see. But we are glad that our county was able to enact that legislation. Um, also, some good news for a few states, uh, but not good news for other states uh, on the coast. As you know, 
Trump rolled back some protection for our oceans uh, and wants to do offshore drilling. Uh, we've talked about that in past panel discussions. He wants to open up much of America's coastline uh, to offshore drilling, um, which would be a travesty because um, oil spills are devastating on marine wildlife and the health of uh, ocean economies, people who depend on tourism, fishing for their well-being. Um, but we're happy about all winds to protect our water, coasts, health, wildlife, and economies. So uh, that being said, in Florida last week, Trump did actually extend a ban on offshore drilling in Florida and two other states. Um, but so far, he's not going to ban offshore drilling in California, Oregon, or Washington, all states that are led by Democrats. Um, so with the 100 rollbacks that hurt clean water, clean air, take away our public lands, uh, the public's right to make public comment, um, bringing back neurotoxic pesticides, all these things that uh, we've discussed so much here at cleanethicus.org. Um, Trump also allowed a neurotoxic pesticide, uh, chlorpyrifos, to be reintroduced after a million dollar donation for, from Dow Chemical, which is the company that helps produce this pesticide. Um, so it's really unfortunate that our president has shown that he's able to be swayed and his environmental policy by corporations that really don't have the best interest of our uh, of our public lands and the health of our citizens at heart. Uh, so moving forward, I want to talk a lot of, little bit about something called the National Climate Assessment, which is when in 2017 and 2018, the federal government published a sweeping two volume scientific report called the National Climate Assessment. Uh, that represents the most authoritative and comprehensive solutions to date about the causes and effects of climate change in the United States. And the report is really clear about the causes, which are burning fossil fuels, <laughs> and the effects. Um, it found that the increased drought, flooding, storms, wildfires, hurricanes um, caused by the warming planet could shrink the American economy by up to 10% by the end of the century. And as Jillian talked about earlier with the 100 rollbacks, Trump directed somebody named Andrew Wheeler, who was a former coal lobbyist, to now be the head of the Environmental uh, Protection Agency, which is the leading government agency that deals with protecting our environment. Um, but Trump told him to roll back or cut major climate change regulations and policies that reduce pollution from the nation's three largest sources of greenhouse emissions. And I'm gonna go through what those three uh, sources of greenhouses emissions are and the rollback that they've experienced. So the first one is uh, rolling back uh, coal uh, restrictions on coal-fired power plants, um, which is super tragic because these power plants put people at kids in ri at, at risk of mercury poisoning. Uh, mercury is a neurotoxin that can harm children's brains. And he rolled back a regulation called MATS, which uh, saved over 11,000 lives a year. And the Trump administration has completely cut this safety protocol and has put thousands of people at risk of mercury poisoning. The second source of greenhouse emissions I'm going to talk about is auto tailpipes. Um, this is something I didn't know about before I came here to Clean Earth for Kids.org. Um, but it's so, I was so surprised to learn about it that um, auto tailpipes, the emissions from cars stalling outside of schools, idling at stoplights, can be extremely dangerous for kids' health. Um, it's bad news for all consumers and people uh, that Trump has decided to roll back regulations on this because we need clean air uh, because the kids breathe here. Um, and the third restriction or the third um, greenhouse gas source is oil and gas drilling sites. Um, we've already talked a little bit today about offshore drilling. Trump has also expanded um, drilling in the Arctic. Um, and Trump has, you know, as we talked about so many, uh, so frequently, he's really made an effort to just open up anywhere to uh, drilling, whether or not that place uh, has vulnerable groups living there, vulnerable wildlife populations, is a public land. Uh, so um, while protecting the world's large economy and fighting climate change, uh, it's, it's really important that we uh, prioritize the health of our, of our ecosystems by uh, making sure that our public officials know that we're not okay with them loosening these restrictions on greenhouse gas emissions. So now Jillian is going to share the Trump administration's rollbacks on methane. And as she said, methane is a powerful climate warming gas emitted from leaks and flares in oil and gas wells. So here's Jillian. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Jonah. Um, so yeah, there are plenty of methane rollbacks to talk about, and I've had um, the pleasure, well, not really the pleasure, uh, of researching several of these. And I'd like to share a couple with them so that you can be just as educated as, as I am. Um, so a little bit more about methane. I've already told you that it is a uh, very powerful greenhouse gas. Um, it has been cited that around 25% of global methane warming or global warming is due to methane. And then most of the oil, most of the methane in the atmosphere comes from oil and gas companies. So I want to talk about specifically rollbacks number 5, 6, 21, 85, and 89. Um, because a lot of these deal with oil and gas companies, which is, again, where most of our man-made methane comes from. So number five canceled a requirement for oil and gas companies to report methane emissions. Now, this means that oil and gas companies can produce as many emissions without letting the public know. And it is vitally important that the public understand um, what is going into the atmosphere at these uh, drilling sites. Um, number six, reverse a rule that limited methane emission on public lands. Now, public lands are essentially national treasures, and we should support them and the wildlife that inhabit them as much as possible. So um, this is incredibly dangerous, and um, it kind of leads into the next one, uh, 21, which is proposed has proposed a relaxing on requirements for companies to fix and repair um, methane leaks at oil and gas facilities. So these uh, drilling sites can essentially leak um, the methane without being forced to be repaired. Uh, then 85 kind of takes it a uh, different route in that braking systems on high hazard trains no longer have to be fixed. So this is very dangerous to the public because we are allowing very flammable uh, fossil fuels to be carried via train without the updated braking system. Just like a car, when you fix the brakes on a car to prevent accidents, the brakes on trains that carry extremely dangerous liquids should also be fixed. Um, and that leads into 90 or 89, excuse me. And unfortunately, the just this past week, I believe the 15th, this rollback was uh, finalized in that it allowed rail transport of a highly flammable fossil fuel called liquefied natural gas. Uh, now, this is especially dangerous because, for one, they don't have updated braking systems anymore. And two, liquefied natural gas is linked to some pretty deadly consequences if not handled correctly. And these trains are allowed to go through um, crowded areas, crowded cities. So these are just a couple of the rollbacks that the Trump administration has either put into place or repealed rules regarding. Um, and they're incredibly dangerous, and it is our mission here to help fight against them. So now, John, would you like to share? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm John. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking more about fossil fuels, um, also some renewable energy and the future of our nation. Um, and that has to do with uh, divestment. So as Jonah mentioned, uh, on September 9th, uh, the NOA released uh, its latest state of the climate report. Um, and it found that just during August, there were four different billion dollar disasters. Uh, so there were the two hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, huge wildfires, and an extraordinary Midwest uh, day ratio. Um, one of these events alone can strain emergency resources. Um, for example, you know, in West, West Coast right now, firefighters are their resources are extremely strained um you know two dramatic cases is crazy uh we haven't seen that in a while but um nowadays i mean so this is called compounding events so basically as our climate is changing 
um, these events are becoming more and more common. And they, when they are on top of each other at the same time, it can break any uh, system. So that's what we're seeing right now. Um, and it's scary because these things aren't going away. They're just going to become more common. Um, but there are still, so one of the major causes for these compound events are, you know, just us polluting the atmosphere and polluting the environment. But there are things we can do to reduce this. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today with uh, divestment. So, yeah. Um, yeah, basically, divestment is really important. Um, basically, divestment is where, uh, you know, so universities, institutions, um, they put money into, you know, the stock market or companies because they want to, um, they want to get future returns on their money. So, for example, if a university puts money into the stock market, they can, you know, make uh, their students' lives, you know, make tuition cheaper or make it more educational. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes, actually, and a lot of times, universities are invested in companies which are actually hurting the future. For example, you know, investing in BP, um, that BP is what caused, you know, the 2010 oil spill. And there were universities and institutions that were invested in that company. Um, so institutions invest for the future, like I said, you know, they want to get future returns and they can, you know, help students and other institutions can do other things in the future. Um, but by funding companies that are hurting the environment, uh, it's, it's just going against what they want to do, which is help the future. Um, yeah. So uh, why does it matter? I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of investment goes on by banks and stuff. So why does it matter that you know, universities or other institutions are investing if they represent a small fraction. Well, um, colleges and universities, you know, reflect the values of our culture um, as well. And, you know, cities and state governments also reflect the values of the communities. Um, so we oftentimes throughout history, we've looked for these, you know, um, educational and government institutions for the future. And they've kind of helped build the future in a way. Uh, and it also, if we don't act, you know, universities are often times, you know, a point of change. And if these universities don't act soon and don't uh, galvanize other institutions to act soon, it might be too late. Thank you. So important. Such important information. It's so important to um, divest. Yeah, for sure. What else would you like to say? Oh, um, well, so I just think, uh, you know, if we can get students in talking more about this, um, it can, it can really change everything, you know, when you have students talking to the administration, and, you know, really inciting change, um, this can make future leaders in our society, which I think is really important, especially for students. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and Jillian, you are starting a divestment campaign. Um, where you are at school over at UNC. Do you want to say anything about that and why you decided to take that action? Absolutely. So I go to uh, UNC Chapel Hill in North Carolina, and recently the uh, UNC school system has uh, continued to support oil and fossil fuel companies. Uh, and it's very stressful being a student who has a pre-existing condition and feels like your university is not listening to you. So I have decided that I'm going to take uh, action against it with several friends and along with a divestment campaign that's already in process. And we're going to draw attention through um, writing letters, contacting the media, and just trying our hardest to get UNC and all of the schools in North Carolina to divest because it is possible. Uh, we have had several schools in North Carolina divest already and it's been completely successful. So there's no reason um, that UNC and every school in North Carolina can't do the exact same thing. You're muted. Suzanne, you're muted. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. 
Great job, Jillian. Um, thank you so much for that. And John Williams, I know that you've worked also um, with uh, George Washington. Uh, let me think about it. Uh, Georgetown, sorry, there you go. Georgetown. Uh, so if you'd like to talk about that, and if you'd also like to talk more about um, about the reasons for um, stopping the sources of pollution, that would be great. And a petition that we can uh, sign as well. And then we'll hear more from Jillian. Thank you. Oh yeah, so at Georgetown, I'm actually, um, basically we have a system where students run this club that then invests um, a portion of Georgetown's endowment, which then, you know, they use to uh, make education cheaper and um, more, yeah. So um, we, we actually, this uh, spring, we had a vote to uh, divest or at least begin a divestment plan, which I think was really important because you can't do it all at once. It has to be a process. Um, but if we don't start the process soon, uh, it might be too late. Um, yeah, actually another thing uh, is that Trump's head of EPA is uh, supporting these very companies that you know are polluting the planet, um, such as coal plants, power plants, and factories, which are emitting even more toxic pollution. Um, and we can encourage divestment, but also, you know, it's we divestment uh, doesn't really you can't affect the government in ways, but you can do things like um, sign petitions and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. Uh, on Clean Earth for Kids, we actually have a petition that you can sign. Um, and yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that and great job on the divestment and your important actions at Georgetown. Thank you again so much for all of that. Um, so Jillian, um, would you like to talk with us about um, uh, Actually, I'm so sorry, I'm a little off right now. So Jonah, Jonah, would you like to talk with us about uh, fires? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, thanks so much. There you go. I'm here. Thanks. So. <laughs> um, thanks so much, John, for telling us about that. Um, I'm super grateful for Georgetown for committing to starting the process of divesting. It, it's such an important thing for our university. I don't want my tuition money going to funding these companies that are poisoning our planet. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about about climate change and namely, you know, the effects of what global warming means uh, on the planet, the effects of having a warmer temperature on the earth. So almost two years ago, uh, the federal government scientists wrote that the greenhouse gases from burning fossil fuels could triple the frequency of severe fires across the western states. Um, which is obviously something that um, we've seen so much in recent years. Um, but the fact that it could triple the amount of fires, we've already, I mean, you know, the fire seasons are already devastating. Uh, oh, my dog's down here. <laughs> the fire seasons are already devastating here in California, but also in states like Oregon, Washington. Um, many cities are working on climate action plans to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions because of the risk that greenhouse gases actually have on fires. Um, as we've seen in California in the recent weeks, um, we've had homes burning, thousands evacuated from their homes, um, people unable to go to work, and uh, this fire season we've had a lot of deaths as well, which is incredibly tragic. Um, many of you have probably seen pictures of cities like San Francisco uh, where the sky is fiery orange and they've blotted out the sun with all the smoke. Um, that's so and it's, it's so dis disappointing that it's, it's essentially preventable uh, through um, changing fire suppression policies and also uh, committing to uh, climate change reform. Uh, it's, so, it's so disturbing that our government has seen, we've seen deaths this year uh, and yet very little action has yet been taken uh, to prevent these fires. So um, also in mid-August, the West had an extended heat wave um, where in Death Valley, the first, this is the hottest temperature on earth was recorded in Death Valley, 130 degrees um, ever in all time. The, the reliable, since we've had like reliable measurements of temperature, uh, we haven't had any hotter reading than that, um, which is 
further suggests that you know the Earth is getting warmer and warmer. Also, that combination of heat with a rare lightning outbreak, which doesn't usually happen in California, um, sparked these first round of major wildfires that we've seen this season. Um, climate change and the, the increase in heat uh, is known to uh, cause the the uh, strange weather patterns, such as you know we don't usually see lightning in California. Uh, so climate change is causing severe and unpredictable weather. Um, the fires that are currently happening now in California are three of the four largest fires in California history. Um, year after year, we see, you know, last year was the worst fire season we've ever had, and this year it looks like we're going to beat it again. Um, also, as this was happening, a powerful derecho storm um, in Iowa, in Illinois, happened. Uh, a derecho is a type of storm. It's highly powerful winds, tornado and hurricane-like winds, but it's even more long-lasting than those storms. It can last, it, this one lasted for days and days, and it caused billions of dollars in damage uh, in Iowa and Illinois. Uh, if that wasn't enough, Hurricane Laura plowed into the Gulf Coast, Louisiana, as a Category 4 hurricane with 150-mile-an-hour winds and 16 feet of storm surge. Uh, just a few weeks later, uh, over Labor Day weekend here in California, we experienced another even more intense heat wave uh, with the southern part of the state where I live uh, hitting 121 degrees west of the mountains uh, for the first time in record keeping history. California has seen a record 3.3 million acres burn so far this year, roughly five times the normal amount for a fire season. And it's 10 times the normal year to date. Scientists say that this is part of an ongoing upward trend made clear by the data and well understood by science. It's not surprising that these fires are happening given the climate change we've seen happening. Fire season is now a lot longer. Uh, that's now two to three months longer than it was just a few decades ago across much of the Western states. And since the 1970s, California has increased a five-fold increase in the amount of annual burned areas and an eight-fold increase in the summer forest fire extent. At least 17 of California's top 20 largest wildfires have burned since 2000. Um, also, sadly, in Washington State, up north, had an estimated 330,000 acres burn across the state in a single day, which is this, a staggering statistic. That's 330,000 acres of uh, beautiful lands, people's homes that have been destroyed because of uh, this increase in temperature. So. Um, with that, I'd like to pass it back to John Williams. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Yeah, thanks, Jonah. I just think we also need to say thank you to our firefighters who, you know, have been fighting these fires constantly for days and weeks now. Um, it's really just, it takes a certain breed, and, you know, we're so thankful that these people are doing their best they can to, uh, you know, save what they can. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's still such a concern. And, you know, we ask ourselves, you know, why would Trump, aggressively promote the burning of fossil fuels and you know this is changing the climate which like Jonah says is causing things like you know abnormally high heat and thunderstorms and stuff like that um why would he roll back cut or weaken every uh, major f federal policy you know with these rollbacks um and I the reason is because you know he he denies or it minimizes um human caused climate change which is just I mean all the data does not support that so um you know, the science is now clear that California and the UC uh, must decarbonize their energy systems uh, much more rapidly than the Senate 100 bill requires in order to, you know, meet the, meet the, um, you know, save the environment on time because we're just, you know, it's like we're getting closer and closer to the point of no return. Um, and, you know, if he doesn't do this and if the government doesn't do this, you know, it's a crime against the planet. Um, it's also, you know, especially affecting minorities and people, you know, who can't just move out when, you know, the, the fire is like coming towards their um, home. Um, so the UC system really needs to align uh, in order to, you know, protect our planet. Um, now I'll send it off to Jillian. Thank you so much, Jonah and John. That is such important information um, and very sad to hear. So the question is, what do you do if there is smoke from a distant fire? Of course, far, far away from your home, and you've been told by the fire authorities that you don't need to evacuate. Um, the first thing is be ready to evacuate and leave the area. Uh, keep a bag packed with things that you'll need for a few days. But if 
uh, another way that you can prepare is a clean room. Now, a clean room is a small room in your house that is completely shut off from smoke. Uh, a clean room would protect you or friends uh, from an unhealthy smoke level. If you were told you do not need to evacuate from a fire, I think that's very important to stress. Um, this small room will protect you from breathing smoke. Uh, uh, conditions can change quickly, so make sure you follow your local news. Uh, there's a website called the Air Now website uh, or your state air quality website for up-to-date information. So who needs a clean room? Well, if there is a fire in your area, you may be able to uh, stay with friends or uh, family who are not affected by the smoke. Uh, you can relocate or go to a uh, public cleaner air shelter. Um, you can seek relief from the smoke in a shopping mall or a large building with a good air conditioning and good uh, air filtration system. Um, if the air is smoky but the fire authorities say that it's safe uh, to stay in your home, that's when you can create a clean air room. Uh, you should choose a room in your home that can fit everyone in your household. Uh, a bedroom with an attached bathroom would work the best. So to prevent smoke from entering the room, you need to close the windows and doors, uh, but don't do anything that makes it hard to get out in case you need to leave. If there is an exhaust fan or a range hood in the clean room space, only use it for a short period. Uh, your goal is to stay cool. You can run fans or window air conditioning units or even central air conditioning units if you have it. Uh, if your HVAC system or air conditioning and heating system uh, or window air conditioner has a fresh air option, turn it off or close the intake. Uh, you can use a filter for the air in the room. You can use a portable air cleaner that's the right size for your room you choose. Uh, and you, can, you should run it continuously on the highest fan setting you can. And if you have an HVAC unit, you can also install a high efficiency filter called uh, MERV 13 or higher. Um, run the system's fan as often as possible to get the most out of your filter. So the EPA released a guide to air cleaners in the home and they also listed some stuff that you should avoid. So avoid activities that create smoke, uh, which include, of course, smoking. Uh, you shouldn't burn uh, gas, propane, or wood stoves or furnaces. No hairspray or aerosol products. You shouldn't fry or boil food. No burning candles or incense. And no vacuuming unless you use a vacuum with a uh, HEPA filter. And even then, it's not recommended unless you're sure that the vacuum has a tight seal. So what do you do instead of vacuum? Dust or mop surfaces in the clean room with a damp cloth. This will help the particles that are on the floor, the blinds, or the furniture uh, from getting back in the air. So. You should spend as much time as possible in the clean room to get the benefit from it, but avoid exercising while you're in the clean room. The public health officials and health uh, emergency managers communities affected by wildlife, wildfire smoke, excuse me, may choose to set up or identify uh, cleaner air spaces or cleaner air shelters where people can seek relief uh, from wildfire smoke. So, more information is, of course, available about these places. Uh, it's called Wildfire Smoke, a guide to a guide for public health officials. Um, research has found has also found that if you want a more natural uh, air filter, that pl some plants have microorganisms in the soil that are effective air purifiers. So the bigger and the leafier the plant is, the better. And in fact, here to talk about plants is Catherine. Hi everyone, I am Catherine. I am with Team 2 with CleanEarthForKids.org. Thank you for the important information, everyone. During this time of wildfires it, in the West in summer heat, leaving water for animals crossing through is a humane thing to do. Did you know that plants can purify the air? Plants take in carbon dioxide, harmful gases, and toxins to purify the air. 
Air purifiers work to reduce PMs or particulate matter, which are toxic stuff in the air. Here are two of the best houseplants you can choose for your home to help clean your air. These are peace lilies. Suzanne, what is your experience with a peace lily? So thank you for asking. I love peace lilies. And the reason is um, years ago when some painting was going on, we put a peace lily in a room and I'm not kidding you. It absorbed the smell and um, the terrible VOCs of the paint. And I was amazed. It was one peace lily, just one, the medium sized peace lily. And also I'd like to say a little bit about um, something that I do to reduce pollen from the peace lily is I actually, you can see um, the white flowers that are there. Um, and then also the big green leaves. I actually just cut off with scissors the stem that is attached to the white flower. I cut that off so that I don't have the extra pollen. And I have done this and had absolutely no problem with the peace lily still maintaining um, and, and thriving and doing great. So I would highly recommend this plant. And I also would like to say that although there have been some studies that are, you know, something said, um, you know, some studies, sorry, uh, talking about uh, questioning the ability of plants to purify the air. This is different than the studies that we all heard about before from NASA. Um, studies are now showing that in a drafty room, the plants uh, are with doors and windows opening that the plants are not as effective as an air purifier um, for removing particulate matter. And while that may be true, that piece, um, I can tell you that having plants in your environment not only is so uplifting and positive, but it really improves the air quality. It adds humidity, so it's easier to breathe, and it's just such a great thing. So I think you're gonna talk to us about um, making sure that the, uh, that the plant is for you, right? So if, um, if it obviously, if you have allergies or something to the plant, then it's a no-go. But I just would like to say that how much I, I, love, I love plants and they improve the environment. So just wanted to say that. So back to you, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. That was a great story. Next, we have the devil's ivy or pothos. These are easy to grow indoor house plants that will fight off common household toxins. It grows well in water, pots, and hanging baskets. Many toxins removed, such as xylene, benzene, formaldehyde, and trichloethylene. Yeah, you got it, and more, right? I'd also like to say that, of course, we have to be so careful with kids and um, pets with plants, right? So you have to check it out and make sure that everybody is safe. So anyway, back to you, thank you. That's right. I think I heard that pathos are actually uh, poisonous to dogs. It's a good thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm, do, mm -hmm. do what you can to stay safe. This means that checking the air quality in your area and staying indoors as much as possible when air quality readings are high and using indoor air filters when possible. Wood smoke is very dangerous. It's 12 times worse than cigarette smoke. Most of the smoke from burning wood is teeny little bits called particulate matter. That's where most of the health risks come from. It can cause your eyes to burn, trigger asthma attacks, and has lots of toxic chemicals like benzene that can cause cancer. So be careful to stay away from smoke whenever you can and don't do campfires in your community, please. Jillian, can you please tell us about the air quality index? Sure, so um, the air quality index or the AQI is a simple indicator of the severity of five major air pollutants that are regulated in the United States. So unfortunately, wildfire smoke can contain a whole host of pollutants. 
the most con the most concerning of which is fine particulate matter, um, which is accounted for in the AQI. So there are many great air quality apps if you want to check the air quality in your area. Uh, I personally use air bubbles on, uh, I think we have a picture of it somewhere. Um, but these levels, it's important to mention that these levels are um, conditional based off where you're located near a, a system. So if the AQI that is near you is lower than 100, uh, the primary air pollutants are at levels that the EPA considers safe or acceptable rather. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean risk-free because some air pollutants have no exposure levels uh, that don't pose risks, um, meaning they're essentially dangerous at every level. So personally, we believe that levels above 50 should not be considered safe. Uh, but deciding on a level that you feel comfortable with to go outside and engaging in normal activity is entirely up to you. So the AQI range of 101 to 150, set, uh, the EPA no. says that these levels can be Wait. unhealthy. Yes, absolutely. I just wanted to say real quick, Jillian, um, that this um, on air bubbles, and I have this on my phone also, so guys, look at this horrendous, horrendous air. We were just talking about this. I mean, this is crazy. So if you look at um, where it's near San Francisco, I mean, it's a 40. So you think about how in, you know, where I am in Oceanside, California, generally it's that, that number, that bubble will be about a 30. And then you look at what's going on with, with these numbers, this is just outrageous. It's so hard to breathe. And this act, this picture actually in from the, the on the other side, on the right hand side of your screen, that says particulate matter 2.5, and then it says 150. This I actually took, or John took, was it yesterday or today, um, here in Oceanside, California. This is crazy. You know, the wildfire smoke, so damaging. And then you look next to it at the bottom where it says PM10, particulate matter 10. That's a little larger when Catherine was showing us on that wonderful graph. And thank you so much to all of you guys. You're just, you just rock. You're amazing. Um, so when she was explaining that to us, um, this right here, here it is. So the PM10 was 168. So if you look at this particle size or particulate size, I should say, um, and you look and see how tiny it is. You can understand how these little pieces get lodged in the lungs, and that's where the problem comes in. So you can see, you know, PM 2.5 and PM 10 um, and uh, all of that stuff. So if you can go back um, to the air bubbles. So I hope everybody has a chance to put either air bubbles or some app on um, their phone. It's really important. Um, our intern, Kevin, well, actually our youth board person, Kevin, who does poetry, he texted me other, the other day and he's like, where's Oceanside? Like it, it was, it was gone. It's because this is citizen science, right? So people have an air meter um, attached to their house. And so it is so incredibly helpful to be able to see this data. And they're also like you guys had said before, data from cities and other stations. And Jillian, you had said it depends on how far away you are. So we have to give a special shout out when I see these numbers so close to Nevada and thinking about Connor, um, one of our interns who's over there living in Hendersonville. Um, he is living in an area that is a depressed area that's like a valley and all the smoke just kind of settles in there. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just been really tough for everyone. And I myself, I've had a, you know, it was really hard to concentrate and things at these levels of just 150. So when you put air bubbles on your phone and you're looking at it and you see what people deal with on a daily basis in other parts of the country, it's just so shocking and surprising. As a teacher or former classroom teacher for what, 30 years? I just want to go and give a medal to every single student who goes to school, who shows up, who studies in spite of it all. And so this is a social justice issue. This is a racial justice issue. Air pollution is targets 
our people because how many pounds of toxic hazardous pollutants are dumped in communities of color and with on low income people. That is why when Jillian and Jonah and John and Catherine, all of us, when we talk about these 100 rollbacks by the Trump administration, if you see us feeling a little passionate, it's because this is an issue of justice and what is happening is just not okay. Now what you're seeing here um, with these high numbers, this is natural, right? This is a wildfire. This is not able to be controlled. But when you look on air bubbles or another source and you see that there is a really high number and you go to that neighborhood and you figure out that there's a coal plant there or horrible incinerator and there are kids living right there dealing with that on an, a daily basis, it just makes my blood boil. So we have to do something and take action because we cannot have another four years of this, uh, you know, this attack on children's health, public health, and our environment. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so one quick note while we're talking about AQI levels. Um, speaking of communities that are at a disadvantage, the EPA says that levels 101 to 150 can be unhealthy for people in sensitive groups. And this is kind of a misleading terminology because the definition of uh, sensitive groups includes people who um, have pre-existing conditions as well as the elderly, but it also deals with healthy children and healthy people who exercise or work outside. Um, it's not exactly the sensitive groups that people most think of and who are most targeted by air pollution. Um, anything over 150 means that you, you definitely should stay inside. Um, now, air quality inside can be very poor as well, depending on some things like if you have pets or how often you clean or if you cook with natural gas. So um, just be aware that outside conditions may actually be better than what's inside and it's important that you use air filters just in case. So um, as you've heard and as Suzanne just told us which is is very frightening, uh, Trump's EPA's or the Trump EPA's rollbacks are making it much harder for all Americans but especially disadvantaged Americans all over country to breathe clean safe air. Uh, smog pollution from power plants, factories, cars, and other sources irritates the lungs. It worsens conditions like asthma and is linked to a wide array of serious diseases and even premature death. Children and seniors with respiratory illnesses are especially harmed by smog and pollution. Um, and these are the people that live in primary Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. So, um, to keep us safe from harmful smog and pollution, the EPA is supposed to regularly update the national standard based on best available medical and scientific evidence. But instead of following that strong evidence, uh, the Trump EPA wants to keep the existing weak standards in place. So let us tell the EPA to tighten the national limit on dangerous smog pollution. Um, down to 60 parts per billion to protect Americans from smog. So um, if you have a loved one with who has asthma or a respiratory disease that is particularly dangerous um, with smog pollution, please tell the EPA your story and why it's important for the administration to strengthen um, the smog standard today. So the EPA is taking comments from the public on its do nothing smog plan through October 1st. Um, no one should have to breathe dirty air. No federal agency should take an anti-science approach to their air pollution and in no community is a, a, an acceptable environmental sacrifice zone. We need safer and stronger uh, smog pollution standards to protect our health and um, yeah um, I think that's about all I have to say. Thank you for listening. I'm with you. I'm with you and Jillian, you know, thinking and all of you guys and thank you for being here thinking about sacrifice zones and thinking about Dr. Um, 
Mustafa Santiago Ali, who worked at the EPA for 24 years, is in Hip Hop Caucus and um, National Wildlife Federation, and um, actually started the term environmental justice. Thinking about him being here with us and with you guys, you know, so proud of, of the important work that you're doing and that he's acknowledging you, and thinking about exactly what he's talking about. I mean, it is just ridiculous the way that people of color are treated in this country. And with Trump taking away, Trump's EPA and the administration taking away NEPA, right? So National Environmental Policy Act, where you don't even have, the public doesn't even have the opportunity to write in and make these public comments as they've done before. I mean, this is a huge concern. So thank you guys so much for all of your important work. You know, you've been acting on climate, you've been protecting children's health and doing such just a phenomenal job uh, doing that. So I think there are a couple of um, petitions that you wanted to talk about. So Sean, did you want to talk about, talk more, Jillian had talked about the smog. Did you want to talk more about the National Ambient Air Quality um, uh, petition? Um, so yeah, uh, you know, the EPA, um, you, we need to, uh, continue, like, they're opening for comments. So like Julian said, you know, we need to keep writing to them, keep telling them it's not okay. Um, but also, yeah, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, also known as NAAQS, uh, they're currently being reviewed right now. So basically, um, this standard sets a limit on the ground level of ozone, uh, particle pollution levels, lead levels, sulfur dioxide levels, carbon monoxide levels, and nitrogen dioxide. Um, and, you know, we, this is under review right now. So, you know, if we don't do what's necessary, this could be changed and um, it could, like, we need to make sure that these levels are on the level so that um, it's safe for everyone. So, yeah. And now, uh, Kathy. Thank you, John. Please sign the petition and ask the Department of Interior to reverse the Alaskan oil plan. The plan would open up 18.7 million acres of Alaska's North Slope to fossil fuel development. The release of up to 51 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. To find out more, please visit our website at cleanearthforkids.org and also I'll post a link in the chat. You can also sign the petition to tell the Department of Interior to reverse the Alaska oil plan. Thank you. Great job. Jonah, do you want to talk about um, protecting the Amazon? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 20 dams are being planned for the Marañón River, which is in Peru, which and it's the source of the Amazon, the Amazon River, which is uh, one of the most uh, biologically diverse places in the entire world. It's an incredibly huge rainforest, um, and it has so many incredible plant and animal species, many of which are uh, people talk about uh, the Amazon River being a source of um, plants, sensitive plants that can uh, contribute to medicine. Um, 18 of these dams that are being planned uh, would be built in sensitive ecosystems and it threatens the really the entire Amazon River Basin. So uh, please sign that petition uh, to protect the source of the Amazon River. Also, there's another uh, petition supporting the Farm System Reform Act, which would hold corporations like Smithfield and Tyson uh, responsible for the pr pollution that these huge farm makes. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but um, factory farms create incredible pollution. Um, cows are highly responsible for much of the methane that's released into our atmosphere, and therefore a lot of much of global warming. Um, but also things like animal waste uh, creates toxic lakes, and uh, this act would hold corporations accountable for for those. Uh, that, that pollution that takes place. It would also ban the construction and, and expansion of concentrated animal feeding operations and restore 
uh, the mandatory label of the country of origin for all meat and dairy products. So please consider also signing that petition. Thanks so much. The shoe strike is a huge event happening to promote Fridays for Future, which started in July. This is happening globally, not just here in Southern California, and is a call of action that many people are participating in. Contribute your shoes and signs to be a part of Fridays for Future. Thank you. And we can have more information on that. We'll have um, on our homepage, people can go to more for more information on that. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, Jillian, would you like to talk about the Thrive Agenda? I think this is such a positive thing to talk about as a last thing that we, um, that we cover tonight. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Thrive Agenda, uh, Thrive, which stands for Transform, Heal, and Renew by Investing in a Vibrant Economy, is simply a goal, uh, a plan really, similar to the Green New Deal that would uh, put people back to work build an economy that prioritizes climate, racial, and economic justice, and just generally benefits society as a whole. Um, more information on that is, of course, available through research. It is a congressional action plan, like we said, um, and I think that's all we have. So thank you, everyone, for attending, and Suzanne and possibly some panelists will stay on to answer your questions. Um, have a great night, everyone. Thanks guys, you're so amazing. Excellent job, thanks again. Okay, see everybody next week and uh, take good care. I'll stay on the line and um, youth and intern may hop off. They've had a, uh, been very busy doing lots of research. So thank you so much.